Now Here we go. Live. This is Brian Mann, Thrive Realty Group, powered by Today Real Estate. And I'm so glad so many folks are here because we were just talking into the the ethosphere for like, I don't know, four minutes. How you doing, Barbara? I'm doing awesome, Ryan. <laughs> How are you? Happy Wednesday. <laughs> you know, you know, at least the, the good thing is it breaks the ice because I know um, you're very, very um, used to speaking in public, but you know, it's always nice to kind of warm into this, right? Instead of just, uh, just go full force ahead. So anyway, uh, Barbara Cotton is my guest today. And Barbara is the executive director of the Southeast region of the American Red Cross. Uh, American Red Cross, as most of you know, is an incredible organization uh, that serves throughout the world for people that are in incredible need, um, whether that's close to home or halfway around the world. So thank you, Barbara, for being here today and uh, visiting with us. Thanks, Ryan. We're very I'm excited. Lucky to have you. So today I wanted to talk a little bit about um, you know, where we are in the market. Right now in the market, as you may have heard, it's, it's not so. <laughs> it's crazy. Um, y y you know, for all of my uh, clients that are buyers, it is a very challenging market because of low inventory. For all my sellers, it is challenging because things are moving quickly and um, you need to be ready. So if you are one of those folks that is thinking, this spring about selling, these are a few things you might wanna think about. The first is um, your paint color does not matter. It, you can have Pepto-Bismol walls, but in this market, people are gonna look past your paint. What they're not gonna look at past is your clutter because clutter seems unkept. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean every book on your shelf needs to be alphabetized? No. But if you have an excess amount of maybe uh, wall hangings or if you have a, a lot of, uh, you know, kids' toys or a bulk of something, um, you, you know, it would, it would be very a good idea to start to, you know, wean that out. You might say, well, I need that where I'm going. Well, I guarantee you, you will not need it all. I promise you, you will not miss most of it. We are goldfish. We meet our containers so easily. However, if you do want to keep all your stuff, and some people have done this just because it's easier, um, there are ways to either get a storage facility or a pod to sit on your property while you fill that, and then it goes to this magical place called Away. And then you come to your new house, and you can unload your crap again. So that may be one way to handle all that clutter. Some people might say, well, you know, maybe what, what about staging it? You know, my house is older, but I don't, I, you know, I've always heard that staging is a really, really good idea. And it is. And if you have a vacant house with no furniture in it and you say, hello, and it goes, hello, 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 right, right? you know, that echoing thing. Yeah. You might want to think about some staging. Okay. However, in this market, people aren't looking at your furniture. People aren't looking at, um, y y you know, what, what brand your couch is okay they're not making sure that it's in the last four years and it's a beach theme okay what they're thinking about is there is nothing else to look at and their house is available we've got to go see it so um really really important it's not that staging is not important we can stage with what your furniture is now get rid of that clutter did i say about clutter yeah i talked about clutter right no clutter get rid of the clutter um so you know, major components. I just, I can't stress this enough. In this market, you can um, almost guarantee 35% more than you would have made if you sold your house three or four years ago. I can almost guarantee that. That doesn't mean you can let it just go, okay? If you have a 40-year-old furnace that's on the fritz, that is going to come up in an inspection. That's going to come up in a multiple offer situation, so if let's say two years ago you would have gotten three hundred eighty thousand and now you're getting almost close to five hundred thousand, spend the ten grand, put the new furnace in, okay? Make sure your components are working right. The septic is going to come up. Let's get that tested. Make sure there's no surprises. It's really really important before you get to that sale. Um, something that I've been starting to do with my clients now. 
if you are living in the home, you really want to have a plan for what you're going to do for hours on end of showings. This is not like, oh, we do one open house and that's it. People want to see the house. And one of the reasons why we're getting so many people through these showings and, th and the price to go up so high is because it's not just a two hour open house and you sell the house. You really have to give people the opportunity to see the house. And when people see, oh, there's somebody else waiting for this house, I'm spending $25,000 more than I thought I was going to. No, put that offer in. That's how it works, right? So um, find a plan, make a plan for making sure that you can be out of your house for extended amount of time, um, three, four, you know, five days in a row for a few hours a day is really what it's going to take to make sure you get the most money you possibly can for your house. And finally, trust your realtor. Okay. I can't tell you enough. I know we all have friends that are realtors. Some of them are good. Some of them are not good. They're great people. They're great people, but you have to trust what they're telling you. And yeah, I know what the market is. And m most of my friends that are realtors and my colleagues that are realtors can give you a pinpointed price of what it's going to sell for. But then I've had people start to say, well, why don't we go for $25,000 more than that? Well, that market is so good. Let's go for $40,000 more than that. Well, I gave you the price for a reason. <laughs> okay. It could mean that you go higher than that. But that's actually built on a manufactured fr feeding frenzy of the buyers that are going to come to your open house, that are going to come see the house because it's listed on different sources. It's not because um, the price is high, okay? Um, yeah, I sold a house a few months ago, went for $70,000 over asking for 28 in 28 offers. That didn't happen by accident. We actually had the, the list price a little bit below what I thought the market price was, and it went way above our expectations. So that is a great strategy, especially in this market, because the more people that fall in love with your house are the more people that are going to put an offer in your house. The old saying that we say in uh, finance, uh, bears get fed, pigs get slaughtered. And that's what's going to happen in this market. And I've already had people that are buyers that say, hmm, that house has been on the market for 22 days. What's wrong with it? Well, it may not be something wrong with it. It may be that their price is over high for what they actually are selling. So um, unless you are willing to spend um, triple and quadruple and, 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 and whatever, let's say you were going to spend $40 for a loaf of bread. You're not going to do it, right? It's not going to happen. Well, that's the same thing with buyers. Buyers are spending um, what the market is bearing. It's not that they're paying a lot. It's that they're paying what the market is bearing. If you put your price way over what the market is bearing, you're not going to sell your house. And those are the five tips for prepping your house for sale. And now we can go to the real important part of this meeting and this, this live cast. And that is to talk to the unbelievably important, unbelievably gracious and wonderful Barbara Cotton from the American Red Cross. How are you, Barbara? I'm doing great, Ryan. It's the middle of the week. It's Wednesday. It's Wednesday night, actually. This is awesome. I love the ability. And I'm here with you. Wednesdays. I know. <laughs> one of the and you're not the only. Yeah. It's so one of the reasons why we love you to death because you can make, it's like, oh my God, there is air. Isn't this wonderful air, right? You know, it's just, that's Barbara Cotton it's right there in the center. Oh, is that what it is? So, so, um, you know, I, you know, I, I opened this up with, uh, you know, Red Cross helps people in 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 tragedy in in so many ways when they when the help is so needed that's when red cross comes in but locally here on the cape and what you're coordinating can you talk to a little bit about what you're coordinating and what what kind of here on the cape what matters to people that the red cross yeah, is doing? absolutely so a lot of like what you've seen this year in the housing market, we have seen just in, in need across the entire region. So the Southeastern Mass region is 81 cities and towns. Um, so it's, it's quite diverse. 
Um, obviously, there are places that are significantly busier than others, but it depends on what we're talking about. Um, you know, and it's funny, I came kind of prepared to talk a little bit about flood um, because everybody you know, equates the Red Cross with what we do in, in that arena. Um, and I actually gave today. I did that at uh, the Austerville Village Library. Um, I was actually originally scheduled, and I'll, I'll add this plug in there because Ryan Castle over at Cape and Islands Realtors has been phenomenal. I was supposed to have given blood last week, um, but he's become a, a really great partner for us. Um, and we're so grateful whether somebody comes to donate blood, somebody comes to work as a donor ambassador, as a volunteer, or we have, you know, people in the community for profit and nonprofit that provide that space. It's amazing. Um, and there's still a considerable need. The Red Cross has been doing a lot of work around that in making sure that we can ensure that we continue to be that 40% of the nation's blood supplier. But, um, you know, we've been doing a lot of work with COVID um, in, in the convalescent plasma arena. So for those who test positive for antibodies, it means that they did at some point have COVID, whether they knew it or not. Um, and then they're providing those life-saving products. Um, but I think a lot more relevant to your conversation around housing is, um, is what we really do every single day. I know you made reference to the disaster across the, you know, the world, and we obviously had a very busy hurricane season, uh, the largest in history, six huge named storms um, that really surpassed anything that we've seen. Um, but locally, every day, we're responding to home fires. And across the state, we um, respond to three, minimally three, every day. Uh, perfect examples, we were five days in a row over a seven-day period in New Bedford. Um, you know, some areas being just significantly more vulnerable. Um, and it doesn't matter that people are home, right? You think like, oh, wait, wait I'm home, right? I, I'm here. People are quarantined, um, but home fires are happening every day. So really and truly, our work is around prevention, and that's the education piece, uh, the response when we show up at the door, um, and then really helping the clients to recover um, from that. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a very significant piece. I've never been, um, thankfully, um, I've never been in a house fire, but think about how much um, money and time and effort these communities spend on our wonderful firefighters, right, to, to fight these fires. When they're done with their job, there's somebody that has to pick up those pieces, right? There's somebody that has to come to those people's rescue. They've lost everything. There's nothing for whatever, even in a minor fire, the water damage does so much damage. It, it really is devastating. And to have an organization that can, uh, you know, help those families regardless of, you know, socioeconomic status, um, yeah. you, you, you know, because, if I lose all my stuff, I'm still losing all my stuff, right? <laughs> you know, I don't have a well, shirt on my back, you know? So we yeah, never make assumptions about that. Um, you know, everybody, no matter who you are, no matter what your situation, you qualify um, for assistance. I mean, we are the only nonprofit that does what we do. Um, and I think there's also a misnomer. People think because we work so closely with government officials, we work so closely with our fire um, and our emergency management that we're, that we're government funded. Um, and we're not. We're absolutely not. We're able to right. do what we do through the generosity of donors and our, our workforce. It's 94% comprised of wow, volunteers. That's yeah. Amazing. So right now, the Southeastern Mass Chapter has 691 volunteers that help across the 81 cities and towns. Um, you and need nine more. We, and we always need more. We you, absolutely you need, do because it's you engaged. Need nine volunteers. More. You need 700, 700 yeah. right now, right? Yeah. Oh. I know if there's anybody here on the call that, that really would like to participate, um, the Red Cross needs you. Um, and, and a volunteer looks like a number of different things. Uh, I think when people hear the word donor, they presume automatically that it's a financial donor and not everybody has the capacity, but a blood donation has just as much impact. One, one unit of blood can help up to three people, Ryan. Wow. So um, I'm on my seventh donation, which means that 21 people over the course of the six or seven months that I've been able to, to donate, um, or actually it's a lot longer than that, but since I've been with the Red Cross, um, have been served by that. And that's really empowering. And we have donors that come in and have been doing it for years. I met a gentleman a couple of uh, donations ago that was on his uh, 50th year of donations. That's amazing. Yeah, it is. That's it's amazing. inspiring. 
So some, something that um, I, I've been thinking about in, in these times with COVID and, and everything that we have going on, um, how are you keeping so many people, I mean, we're talking, you know, blood and we're talking, you know, sanitary environment to begin with, but how are you keeping people safe through the pandemic with blood donations? Yeah, how are you doing great that? question. Ryan, because everything we do. So, you know, I, I guess if there's any organization that's most equipped to have handled this pandemic, it's the Red Cross, right? We we know how to function in major disaster. We know how to function in crisis. Um, and although COVID is unlike anything we've ever seen, right, where we're building the plane while we're flying it, but we know how to build planes. So there's a confidence in that. Um, and so when we shifted our matrix very early on to encourage people to respond virtually, um, we were able to make those adaptations. So um, it's not ideal that you can't hold the hand of a client who's watching their home burned down um, in front of you, but we're able to give them that client assistance. We're able to interface in a way that keeps us safe um, during blood donations. The larger the space, obviously, the better. The social distancing, uh, there are temperature checks. Um, it, it's just, a, I guess, a heightened level of a lot of the things we were already doing because we need to ensure that the nation's blood supply is secure and it always is safe. I mean, the FDA regulates that and we do know certain things like you can't get COVID from blood um, or blood donation. It, 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 you can't. Um, but that doesn't mean that if we're on top of each other without masks, that it's not going to happen. That's the right. reason why. Um, and so there is always mask wearing. Um, there is a screening. We encourage anybody, listen, we, we really would like you to donate blood. If you are feeling healthy and well, please donate. Go online, schedule an appointment. For any reason you're not feeling well that day, as much as we might need you, we need you to be healthy. And we want to be able to ensure that to the, to the public. So don't come. Reschedule. Um, absolutely. Sure. Well, that's excellent. And now, how many blood drives do you have going on currently on a monthly basis here on the Cape? Well, you know, there's a lot of it that's driven by metrics and population. The Red Cross has its real, its, its own donation pool, so to speak. Um, and so you're able to give blood every 56 days. And so we try to have blood drives in communities that allow for easy access for so many of our visitors. So for me, um, today I donated in Osterville. Osterville has been an amazing partner. So they'll offer two or three blood drives because as this you know, kind of center in Barnstable, um, many other towns can come to Osterville. Um, when we do it in Mashpee, we'd like to be able to have a cadence that allows for them to be able to easily give on that kind of every other month basis. Excellent. And we could do that. Um, and it's been a challenge, Ryan, you know, uh, as so many different organizations have been closed or shuttered, people are working from home. The buildings that we used to have accessible to us are, are not right now. Uh, colleges and high schools make up a lot of the supply that we're able to depend on and understandably those communities are closed um, they'll do closed drives but everybody's struggling right now with that so it's really our job to invite the community to learn more about what we're doing how we're doing it and how you can help and i think sometimes just mentioning it and having the opportunity like we are talking today um, to let people think like gee you know i have a space that's about 2,000 square feet or more um, easy access in running water, access to bathrooms, it's not being used, why not donate that space to the Red Cross for them to be able to collect? Uh, and feasibly, we can collect about 30 units. So that means that 90 people are helped by the blood products that are donated that day. And that's pretty impressive. That is amazing. And, you know, you know I, I do wonder, um, you know, those folks that are either looking at this live or those folks that are listening to it after it's been broadcast, do you know a place in our community or in your community that uh, could host a blood drive? Um, you, you know, I, I, I just think about this is the, this is the literally the lifeblood that keeps us working, that keeps us moving, that keeps us alive, right? Yeah. How great of a gift is it that you can give that for somebody that is in need, right? At their yeah, worst moments. The other piece too, 
part of that, Ryan, is, is really around educating the community for why there is such a need. Um, and I think people have the impression that it's only around trauma. So, you know, when people were not out on the road and they weren't driving, there were very few car accidents, right? Relatively speaking, because people weren't on the road. But that didn't mean that there weren't elective surgeries or that there weren't those who rely on that for treatments. So whether you're, you have leukemia or cancer, um, anemia, um, a pregnant mom in a maternity ward could need that blood. Um, and, and those who, who require apheresis as a sickle cell uh, patient. Uh, and again, some of them need as many as 10 units every month. Um, mm -hmm. it, it's, it's unbelievable. And so we can't leave America and, and our community stranded um, when they rely on that to be a continuous flow. Yeah. So um, if people want to give blood, let's start with that. Where do they go? How do they do that? So Red Cross, uh, redcross.org backslash blood, and they can go on to schedule an appointment. And so what I would encourage everyone to do, if you're hearing this, is if, if you want to donate, don't expect you're going to be able to do that tomorrow. It's going to take you a few weeks to get an appointment. But just making that appointment tonight is huge. It's the step in the right direction because then we know we can rely on you to be able to do that. Um, if you're not able to donate blood, encourage somebody you know to do that. Absolutely. Um, I, I'm not one for needles, but let me tell you, today's experience was amazing. Phlebotomists were outstanding. My, the blood donor ambassador, I happen to know David. Hi, David. Um, he, he just makes the experience warm and welcoming. And we all know with anything, right, Ryan, you have a positive experience that first time you're encouraged or confident to do it again. Um, and that's really our goal with our blood donor ambassador. It's one of the very few in-person opportunities for volunteers. And we know so many people in the community are looking to give back. They haven't been able to do that in person. And if they feel comfortable doing that in the community, and now the vaccine is being rolled out for those who are forward facing in that role, um, and another great reason to, to join us as a volunteer is to be a blood donor ambassador. And again, it's that person who helps somebody to check in, um, makes them feel comfortable, make sure that they're feeling well, uh, and encourages them throughout their donation to want to return again. Well, I think... And they can also find out information on how to volunteer on redcross.org. Okay, so how about if somebody wanted to... They, they said, I know this place that we could use that's more than 2,000 square feet, has a sink, has access to bathrooms, um, and I think we could host a blood drive. Who do uh, they contact for that? Ryan, I'm so glad you asked. Me, oh. directly. They can contact me. And my email couldn't be any simpler, and you put a dot in the middle. It's barbara.cotton at redcross.org. Okay, so barbara.cotton at redcross.org. I want to see like 15 emails to you with great locations. And it doesn't necessarily have to be right here on Cape Cod, right? It can be somewhere in okay. Plymouth. It can be Brockton. It could be New Bedford. How, what, how far is your region? Where do you go Our to? Our region is really all the way up into like Randolph, Avon, okay. Holbrook, uh, over to Bellingham, uh, Foxborough, uh, Rentham. Yeah over to the south coast so dartmouth fall river new bedford all of cape cod and and the islands okay. so it really is broad and i think in terms of you know people feel like when they're giving you know does does their our community is bigger than just the town we live in and so i think that's really the power of a donation when i donate i go in through the red cross um blood um app and I would encourage everybody, if you don't have this, it's amazing. It'll help you to schedule. It reminds you when your appointment is coming up, you can do a rapid pass so that you can bypass all of the reading that you would do there. So again, safe, contactless. But I will get a, um, when my blood is received um, and processed, I will get a notification that it's in step one. And I will also get notified where it goes. And then cool. I get a final notice to whom it was given. So I know one went to Springfield to a, um, a maternity ward for a mom. And I know that at another time it went to Worcester uh, to the trauma center. So again, it's that, it's that little bit of connection to know a little bit more about the person that you helped. And in today's day and age, our community is so broad, Ryan. Um, you, know, you might think like, gee, I only want my blood to stay here, but think about the people in your network. Um, and do they all have treatments that are here on the Cape? Sometimes they don't. So it could be that that's going again, 
most importantly to somebody who needs it the most. And that's probably the, the proudest moment for me is to know that my pint of blood is going where it's needed most. Well, I, I thank you so much. Um, just like when we're giving blood, it's time to start wrapping it up. Um, but, you know, I very much appreciate everything that you're doing in your role at the American Red Cross. You're one of my heroes. Thank you for coming on tonight. And um, yeah, uh, redcross.org. If you're looking to donate blood, it's, what is it? Uh, Redcross.org. Or they can email me directly at barbara.cotton at redcross.org. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much, Barbara, for all you do. And we look forward to great things ahead with the Red Cross. Thanks. Thanks so much, Ryan. Bye-bye.